Hello, I am Bentham and welcome to Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator or whatever the hell the name is, I don't know. Simulator Bridge Spaceship, what, what, what else do you want me to call it? Anyway, today I'm going to show you how to play Artemis because it's a bit of a fiddly thing. It's essentially about half a dozen different games combined into one big awesome game. Um, so, you know, it's this, it, like, you're, you're people on a starship. You are the crew of a starship and what it basically means is, you know, you need to know, you need to go through starship driving, tra well, the command training, I don't know, training for whatever role you're going to do in, in it. So, you know, if you, th there's so much to, to learn in it that you can have one role the whole time and not have any idea how the other roles work or anything, just be focusing on one aspect of it. So what I'm going to try and do today is to give you a quick um, and hopefully useful run through of the various different stations that you can use and what each of these stations can do so that you have a better idea of how to play the game and how to play the station. Well, if you choose to play one station, at least you know how the other stations work so that you can tailor how you act to help in that sense and make you better at the game because that's always a good thing. So what I've done here is I've set up a game in which I am everything. The way you do this, if you ever want to do it yourself, is that you need to run two versions of Artemis at the same time. Um, so I have two screens because because um, um, I'm awesome and I play a lot of games and you need two screens for such things. So what I have is I have Artemis in one window as the server, which is running the main simulation and so on and so forth, and in that I've set up the game, I've got it already, and then I've set up the and a second inter iteration, which is this one that you see before you, this is in a, a, this is in a much higher resolution, because you don't need the other one to be in a higher resolution, um, and this one I've connected to it as a client, I've selected all of the stations, and that means that I, if I now select start on the other window, the game will begin, and in fact I believe I will do that now. You need to have a helm and a weapons console connected in some way or other to the server to be able to begin the game. So either you have an iteration of the game up which is both Helm and Weapons or you have two other computers connected which is the better way one of which is Helm, one of which is Weapons and so on and so forth. Um, you can have one computer being multiple stations if you want on the same screen or in two different ones depending on how you want to do it. It doesn't really matter. So we'll begin and it'll take a second to load and then here we are, so you can see, we can now see our ship, and what we are currently in is the main screen. Um, now this is the, basically the same as what is currently going on in the other window. The other window always acts as the main screen in a game. Um, it can only be the main screen, so you always have to have at least two versions of the game running, whether they're on separate computers or the same one, because the main one will only work as the server and the main screen, so what you would do is project that onto a big screen in front of you while you have the stations on the other computers. So, um, this is what the main screen view looks like, this is what I've currently selected, so now what we will do is go into the helm, so... We'll click that, and here we are, so this is what the helm view looks like, you can see it's a top-down view, you've got your ship there, You've got these arcs here, these are the firing arcs, so there's one firing arc going around this side in the front, another firing arc going around this side in the front, so they both overlap here, and over here there is one um, in each area, over here that we have no coverage of the beams. We're currently in the light cruiser by the way, that's, so this one has two beams, it also has two torpedo tubes, but that's more weapon stuff really. So, you can see there's various different buttons here, you've got all the various readouts, so these tell you how much energy you have out of a thousand, um, what level your shields are at out of a hundred, um, the state of your beam weapons. This, the, the, these are, this is sort of a general readout that displays on a lot of the, a lot of the different stations. So sometimes the information on them is irrelevant to you. So you've got the like some stuff about the weapons, then what weapons we have in stock, and then whether the shields are on or off. Let me just switch that on so you can see. Now it's on act, as in active, and if you switch it off, it goes away again. Um, I, ex I assume there's also uh, something that it says when the shields are down or damaged or whatever. At the moment, they aren't, so I can't check. But that's a, that doesn't matter. So you can see we can um, we've got a zoom control here, so we can zoom in or out. Um, an important thing to note is that you cannot see any in you can't see any ships beyond this circle here. So if you can't see anything and everyone's telling you that they can see something that's like here, that's because it's not in range yet. So you can't see it. Um, you can see we've got a station down there, that's DS1, you usually spawn next to it. We've also got a little flickery blip there, that's a little bit of, a, of an interesting thing there. If we go into the main screen view, you can see that we have here the, the visual representation of what that is. That is a 
I believe it's called an anomaly. What happens is, if you crash into it, you get a thousand power. Pretty useful. They're dotted around the map, and they only appear as tiny little flickering pixels, which is annoying, but, you know, makes it a challenge to find them. So let's get to how we actually control the ship. So here we have two sliders. This is the impulse slider. If I push this up, we get to impulse 100. We go to the main screen. You can see we are now moving. So, of course, the impulse goes from 0 to 100, and that's how it works. Pretty simple. Um, you can also increase and decrease it with W and S, though it is a little bit fiddly. You can see it sort of twitches around a bit. Because, um, of course, this, this game is still in development. There's a some refining that needs doing. It's made by one man and so on and so forth. Now for steering you want to click on the location that you want to point. So you can see we've got a compass all around here with the various bearings on it. So what you'll be getting as you battle is the captain will be saying go to um, 60 degrees. So you can click on 60 degrees and it'll take you there. You have to click within um, this bearing, this compass circle. You can't click outside of it. It doesn't work. You click inside it works fine. You can see there's a big circle. Oh we got an enemy ship behind us. So that's what it looks like when an enemy ship flies past you. You can see it's got its various beam marks, it's got different ty types of beams, and you can see it's got um, distance in, um, information there, and it's got bearing information there, and it's call sign, which is X37 for that. We've got an allied ship over here, I-66. This has a, a bearing and a distance as well. And this is the distance relative to you, in case you're wondering, I don't know. Um, so, oh, there's all sorts of stuff flying around here. It's all happening at once, but anyway... I pointed ourselves at this little flickery dot here and we'll now bring ourselves towards it. So I'll switch over to the main screen so you can watch us arrive at it. So there it is, spinning gracefully and then we fly towards it and at some point when we get near it, it will explode. Which is when we hit it. There we go, so it's exploded. And if we now go back to Helm, you can see the readout shows that we have 1,995 science and, well not science, energy and dropping because of course it drops as you use power. At the moment, of course, we are flying and that uses power. So that's the impulse speed. What we also have is warp speed. This is this green slider here. Oh, by one thing I missed, actually. Uh, this slider at the bottom that you can see here, um, you can use this for steering. So if you turn it one way, we'll point one way. And if you turn it the other way, we'll point the other way. You can see it is a little bit fiddly again. It's better to, to just click, really. Um, what you can also do is steer using um, A and D, and what that will do is move this slider. So if you hold down D and then let go, you will continue to turn. Um, and you want to get it back to the middle point if you want to stop turning. Though really the best thing to do is just click to a location near where you're pointing, and that will automatically return it to the middle without you having any problems there. Another feature that you also have is if you want to suddenly stop from impulse, you press space and that will bring you down to zero speed. Now, if we go over to the warp slider, we um, if we raise it up, you can see we go to warp 1. Also, our impulse um, uh, bar automatically goes up to 100. Um, you can carry on um, warping up to warp 4, but at the moment you can see we are in a nebula. You can, dis you can see this from all these purple splodges we've got around. So if I turn ourselves around, um, try and get us out of this nebula, we you'll see that this number here goes up to 4 as we can jump up to warp 4. Um, and then w once that happens, there's a little bit more warp in the way. You can also, oh there it goes, uh, we're speeding up a little bit. And we should be out of the nebula completely. There we go, so we're up to warp 4. And then if I press space, we will um, warp will cut out. And we will cut down to um, impulse 100. You can then press space again to cut it down to 0. So, let's zoom that out a bit so you can see things a bit better. So you, we were to go into the nebula, we could only go at warp 1 because that's how nebulas work in this game. So yeah. So that's how that works. You can also use the, the number keys on the pad, uh, well, on, on your computer, to go to warp 1, 2, 3, and 4, and space to go back down to 0. And you, then you can use space to stop again, of course. Now, there's a couple of other little things here. For example, we have this here. This is the, um, uh, let's see, what would you call it? This is like the 3D movement controls, basically. So if we press this, we are now climbing. So if I go to the main screen, you can sort of see that we are going up. It's sort of difficult to see, actually. Let me just hop back into the helm for a minute, press a button, and then go back. There we go. So you can see we're pointing upwards and we are rising relative to everything else. Go back into the helm, press it again, we go down back to neutral, press it again, we go to diving. So now if you go to the main screen, you can see we're dropping down again. So that's how that works, and it's not got that many applications at the current moment, because things can still shoot you. Um, but you, it's sort of a, the earliest implementation of a sort of 3D system. 
So we're back down to the middle, so I'll press up and that will get it back to neutral again. So we're now um, staying level at the, the sort of middle height. Uh, there's a couple of buttons here. This is request dock. In fact, let's let's um, see this in action. So if we hop into warp 1 there, there's DS1. We'll just hop in there. And once we get close, we'll bring ourselves to a halt. Uh, you can see oh, we're sort of crashing into it a little bit there. So if we now press request dock, we will be tracked into the station. You can see it there, we're being tracked in. A little bit of a lag actually there, which is interesting because um, I can see the main screen on my other um, my other version of the of Artemis that is open and it's running totally smoothly there, but of course it has to transmit the location information from one version to the other and it's not that efficient with it really. So we're getting a bit of lag there. Um, it's not usually a problem though, I don't think. It, it, I believe that is actually part of my settings. I've set it to update every so often, so I think it's a, like... I'm, I'm not sure, it's a certain number of times a second, so whatever speed is it, it's updating here is what it's been set to. So you can set it to update quicker or slower depending on um, how good your, your technology is for that. Anyway, we're slowly being pulled into dock by the station. It's actually taking quite a while, so I can't be bothered waiting around. It will, all you need to do to undock is um, activate impulse at any level. So we've gone to impulse 20 there and that's moved us away. The tractor beam has stopped and everything is normal again. So you can see right now we are not moving because I've turned the impulse off again. Uh, we also have a reverse button. Um, basically it's like reverse gear. You press that button and now if you accelerate you go backwards. So we'll go up to um, full impulse and you can see on the main screen we're going backwards. You can also see the exhaust is currently flying through the ship and that's because reverse is something that was implemented in I believe the most recent update. So you know there's still some ironing out of that to do and it's not a particularly important thing really. It's just a, a, a visual thing that's not it doesn't affect the gameplay at all. So bring ourselves to a stop again and you have to press the reverse button again and that will um, bring us back into normal going forwards mode. Um, you cannot go backwards in warp. I believe if you reverse and then go to warp, it works, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. If you're in reverse, then you cannot go to warp at all. The button will not um, activate. So that's something to bear in mind. If you're ever not being able to get to warp and having no idea why, it's because you've forgotten to come out of reverse. Now, what we also have is a shields button. So if you press this, the shields will come up. And you, as you can see, it says active there as before. And there's now to some uh, green... Uh, lines around here. So this is the front shield arc and this is the rear shield arc um, and they will go into yellow and then red and then gone depending on the the state of the the shields um, in battle. So if we switch that you can see the rings go away again and that's how that works. You can also hear there's a, a nice noise that accompanies it. Uh, but anyway that is pretty much it for the controls of Helm. So uh, the one remaining thing that we do have on here is the camera controls. So um, this is something that you can find in the helm and the weapon consoles. Um, it's only in those consoles and not in any of the other main ones. Um, I'm not sure of the reason for this. I suppose it makes more sense for helm and weapons to be the ones controlling the camera. So this, what these buttons do is control what happens on the main screen that you have, on the main version of Artemis that you are running. So we've got the main screen at the moment. We are looking at the left of the ship and that is because I did that earlier when I wanted to show you as rising and falling. So if I press front view, then we go to the main screen. You can see we're now at the front. Now, of course, I have to switch over to the main screen when I do something to show you what state it's in, but I have the main screen up next to me, and what happens is when I press that button, it switches immediately to the new view. So you can see there we've got front, and of course it's right. Also, there's this camera button. Now, this this doesn't isn't a, a camera option like the other ones. If you press this, it changes the mode of all of these four cameras. So if we do this now... Oh, it's not worked. Why is it not worked? Well, that is interesting, actually. That seems to be a bit of an error that we have, because on the main screen right now, it is showing first-person view for the ship. However, in the main screen version on here, it is not showing it like that. That's something I haven't encountered before. Um, so there's a cam... You, basically, when you do this, it switches to first-person. If you click it again, it switches back to third. You have to click it each time. Um, and unless you click it again, you will stay in the in the mode that you were in previously. So bring that. that's on third-person now, though it's not making any difference to the main screen view. So we have three other views that we that we have access to. So there is the tactical view. So if we go back to the main screen now, you can see it looks like this. And this is sort of similar to the Helm's view a little bit, but it's sort of different. Because you can see outside of the ring that um, Helm would be able to see. And you can see various things that are going on. You've got a nebula here, we've got an asteroid belt here. 
This is a space monster. You go near these and they kill you. That's pretty simple. Um, but you can... They, they will chase you. And what you can do is um, have them chase you into a group of enemies and then warp off so it can't catch you. And then it shoots the enemies instead, which is quite fun. Um, you can see we've got stations here. DS1, 2, 3, and 4. And there's also a black hole sort of thing going on over there. Wormhole or whatever. It doesn't take you anywhere. It just annihilates you if you fly into it. Of course, these red things are enemy ships and the blue things are allied ships. You can see we've got a bit of a battle going on over there between a blue ship and a red ship, which I'm not going to bother about because I'm busy demonstrating things to you. You can also see we have a grey thing over there. That's something that hasn't been identified. It could be an enemy, it could be an ally. At the moment, it always turns out to be an enemy, but of course, things may change in the future as more features are added to the game. And also over here you can see we have um, some green things marked as Xeno. There's quite a few of them in a cluster. What these are are space whales, so you can enjoy going space whale watching in your future missions. Um, they, they make noises as well. I, I can't remember if everyone can hear them or the comms officer alone can hear them, but they make a nice singing noise anyway. So we'll hop back into the helm view again, and now we'll switch to long range scanners. So if we go back to the main screen now, you can see... It's very similar to the tactical screen, but it shows the entire map, and it also has um, important status things going on up here. There's actually some overlap. Usually you wouldn't have this, this many tabs at the top, um, and indeed you don't have this on the other screen that I have here, because the other screen is only the main screen, so there's no tabs along the, the top or any sort of options or anything like that. In this case, there's things in the way, because I've got a ship, I've got th this version of Artemis that I'm on, I have it set as every single station at once, and a few things that aren't stations. So you can see it's got information about the states of the front shields, rear shields, whether the beam weapons are on, on, on auto fire or manual, whether weapon lock is on or not or whatever, um, stocks of, uh, of weapons, of energy, and whether the shields are on or off. And you can see the entire map here, so we'll hop back into the helm for a final time, and we will press info. And so now if we hop back into the main screen, it's broken. Well damn. Um, right. So what it should show right now is, well, it's got all this information along here, as it should do, um, showing the various things, but it also shows what power um, levels are in various different systems, um, based, I believe this is, it's either, I think it's just about damage, actually. It just tells you if it's less than 100%, it means that one of the nodes that is meant to be um, powering this is damaged for whatever reason, and so it's not at full capacity, and then we've got all the usual information over the top here. Now what should be displayed in the middle here is what you can find in this tab here, the engineering tab. So you can see we have a ship here. Uh, now all this stuff down at the bottom you wouldn't see on the info view. This would just be this ship rotating slowly, which I will now simulate, because why not? And you can see the various different nodes that we've got, that we've got in the ship, and it will tell you if they're damaged, they'll appear as red. Um, and you can also see these flashing diamonds, these are damage control crews, who will go around the ship fixing everything. Um, the rest of this stuff is all to do with the engineering station, which I will get to later, so we'll hop back to the main screen. That is what should be displayed in the middle here, the ship rotating with all the important status stuff on it. So, um, the idea behind this whole camera control thing is that the captain can only see the main screen. I mean, he may be able to look over people's shoulders at their stations, but he's usually going to be looking at the main screen, and so he's going to need to ask the people controlling helm and weapons to change what the main screen displays based on what he wants to know. So he might want to have something on screen, so he'd go to front view for that, or he might want something on the long range scanners, or in tactical view if he wants more detail, or info if he wants to know the status of his ship. So that is it for the helm con the controls. So now we'll go on to the weapons. So we'll go over here. Um, you can see the, the, the way it looks is very similar to Helm. Um, let me just, I'll hop back and see. There's basically no, oops, that's the wrong one. Basically no difference to what you can see in the middle of the screen. You have the ship and you have the compass markings and you have your B marks and so on. You can see what is, dis what is present in terms of ships within this circle. You can zoom in and out as before. Uh, by the way, I mean within this circle here. Um, whereas uh, this circle, um, the only thing that it does is when you are Helm, you have to click within it to turn the ship. So the things that are different here, oh, we also have the camera controls, by the way, should mention that. We also have all the status information over here. So the things that are different for Helm are that we have the weapon control. So you can see we have the four types of weapon here. They're all missiles. We have EMPs, mines, nukes, and homing missiles. So uh, we also have the tubes here. This ship has two tubes, so we have tube one, tube two, of course. And what we would want to do is, um, if we want to load something into a tube, we select it. So you can see I've selected type one homing here. And then we press load on tube one, and it will start loading it. You can see this bar fills up. 
and once it is full the weapon will be loaded and ready to fire. We'll also we'll get an EMP and we'll load it into that tube. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about the weapon. So a homing missile is the basic weapon. It, it You shoot a projectile at the opponent. All of these, well, no, actually not all of them are homing. All but the minor homing. So the, the homing missile will home in on the enemy and hit them. And it will do a, a small amount of damage. Um, I believe it's more than the, it'll be more than the laser, but not that much more, I would think. Because it does take quite a few homing missiles to actually destroy an enemy. Um, now a nuke is basically the same as a homing but it is much more powerful it will destroy the ship it hits usually completely and it will also have have a large explosion and do a significant amount of damage to the ships around it so it's very good for taking out large groups of ships um, of course the rarer and you can only have you can in this particular ship you can only have two at a time it's different for different ships of course some ships will have more capacity than others just as they'll have more tubes than others so what we also have is the EMP. This works like a homing missile, but rather than doing damage, it um, takes down shields. So it, it's, it's an EMP. It um, disrupts the shields, basically. Um, when it hits the, the ship, it will do a certain amount of shield damage. It will also have an explosion radius, and ships within that radius will also have the shields damaged. It can also affect you. Both the nuke and the EMP can explode and damage you in the same way that they would damage the enemy. Though the EMP can never do physical damage, it is only damage to shields. So what you would usually do is fire the EMP followed by either homings or nukes. Though usually nukes are powerful enough to take the shields out as well. Now the fourth type of weapon that we have is the mine. Um, this is different from the others in that it does not home in on the enemy. It in fact doesn't move at all. You launch it and it gets chucked out of the back of your ship and lands... Well, it just comes to a halt um, a short distance behind you and then floats there. Um, and it's a mine, so if anything flies near it, it will explode, and it will explode with the force of a nuke. So it is a powerful weapon, assuming that you can get the enemy to come near it and not go near it yourself and kill yourself. So um, you can have a lot more of them in a ship, and so that's the use of them. You can, If you run out of nukes, you can try dropping these, and they will be as powerful as a nuke, but more difficult to deploy with the bonus of the, you being able to have a lot of them available and of course you can just leave them sat around somewhere as a trap for the enemy so they might warp somewhere not think, not realizing there's mines you could put mines around an enemy uh, uh, yeah, an enemy station if you're doing PvP so that the they can't get to their station without blowing themselves and possibly even their own station up and so on so that is all the weapons there, that, well all the, all the missiles, you also have beams of course that, that is demonstrated by these firing arcs here, you can shoot at anything that is within the firing arcs um, so if there's a ship here you could shoot it with one beam, if there's a ship here you could shoot it with two if there's a ship here you could shoot it with none, if there's a ship here you could shoot it with none some ships have um, longer range beams so that you could shoot things further away and so on and rear beams as well and all sorts of different things like that um, and now a control that we have for the beams is this auto beam system, so if we press this um, and it turns off, we're now on manual targeting mode. So if we were to now target an enemy, it will go into manual mode where you sort of have a binocular kind of view and you can see physically the enemy ship um, as if you are on your ship looking at it. And you can then um, click on different areas to target sp specific areas of the enemy ship so that you can disable either its shields or its weapons or its warp or whatever you're intending to disable first. Of course, you may just blow it up anyway. Another thing that we have here is the frequency controls. So you can see we have frequency A, B, C, D, and E. And this is about shield harmonics, basically is what it is. So it's something to do with uh, the science station, which is what I'll be looking at shortly. So basically all you need to know at this point is that um, your science officer will tell you what the weakest shield frequency of the enemy is. It will be A, B, C, D, or E. And if you then set the beams to said frequency, you will damage the enemy shields quicker. It has no effect if the sh enemy shields are already down, it's only for taking the shields down initially. Um, that's pretty much it for the beams. So we also have the shields button as before, it does the same thing as helm. Um, what that does mean is that you sometimes get cases where helm and weapons both press the shield button at the same time and accidentally switch them on and off, which is quite funny and also very dangerous. So sometimes it's a good idea to designate who in each game will be the shield controller or so and so on and so forth. Uh, but whatever. Now uh, we have the zoom controls as before. And then we have this final interesting feature down here, tor Torpedo to Energy and Energy to Torpedo. Basically, this means that you can turn homing missiles into energy and vice versa. So at the moment you can see we have seven homing missiles um, here. So I will press the Torp to Energy button. 
and well, it didn't work. Interesting. Why didn't it work? Let me try it again. It's not working. That's quite a surprise. That doesn't usually happen. Let's try the other one then. Energy to torpedo. Again with not working. That's very strange, actually. I'm not sure why that's happening. Um, let me check that, we're, that the game's still... Yeah, the game's still running and everything. Everything's still running absolutely fine. But for some reason, we can't actually... Oh, I know what it is. It's because we are at our limit for homing missiles and also for energy. We are above the um, energy limit of 1,000. And it will not let us go above that. Of course, I've got about that f particular feature. So I suppose I'll demonstrate the firing of weapons so that we can actually try it. Um, so you can see here we've got the AMP and the homing loaded. We'll try firing the homing. And you can see there it goes. If we go to the main screen, you can see it flying away. It's got a slightly weird trajectory there for you, but um, on the main screen it's um, flying in a much more normal way. It's flying normally now. We go back to helm. You can see it flying away. A little red marker. If the enemy fires a missile at you, I believe it comes in as a sort of brown arrow thing. You can see it exploded there before it got to the edge of our um, of this line here. Because um, all of the, the missiles have a certain range to them. The, the, of course, the um, the mine can go as far as it wants. Well, the, the mine doesn't move, so it, it just stays around forever. But uh, missiles will explode after um, traveling a certain distance, so if an enemy is running away quick enough, they can outrun them and then uh, avoid being killed by them. Uh, what we can also do is unload. So if I press this, you can see the red bar starts to deplete again, and when it is finished, the EMP will be back in our um, missile stocks and we'll be able to load the tube with something else the moment it's tied up while it's unloading. Now you can't unload a tube until it is fully loaded, so if you accidentally load the wrong thing, it's going to take a quite a long time for you to be able to load up the entire tube and then unload the entire tube again to load something else in. So you have to be careful about things like that. Um, now going back to Torpedo to Energy, we now have less than 1000 energy and we also have less than 8 homing missiles. So let's t first turn energy into torpedoes. So you can see we just lost 150 energy. And our, to our torpedo count has gone back up to 8. If we do this um, torpedo to energy, you can see the count has gone back down to 7 and our power has gone up by 100. Now that is an, an important thing to note. Um, you gain 100 power from turning a torpedo into energy, but you lose 150 if you're turning energy into torpedo. So energy is lost um, if you transfer it from one to the other and, and back again. So something to bear in mind, but it's a good way to sort out. Um, any problems you may have with your um, homing missile stocks or your energy stocks um, in a battle. Um, so that's always useful. It's a good feature to, to have if you run out of power and you're trying to limp home or whatever. Or you need some weapons to kill the enemy with. So that's pretty much the weapon system then. It's got um, all that stuff plus of course the readout of, from previously and the camera controls from previously. Uh, one more thing, when you want to shoot someone you target them. Um, when they are within this ring here um, if you click on them, a marker will appear, that uh, means you've targeted them, and then all homing missiles will home for them, and if your beans are in auto mode, you will shoot them with them. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So now, we will try the science console next. So, here we are. This is the science console, and it's very similar to the um, long-range scanner view that you have on the main screen. The difference being that you can zoom in and out, and you can move around on it, and you can look at the various things that we have. So we can zoom right in on various locations, so we can look at this, um, oh, let's zoom in a bit too much there, we can zoom in on this here cloud of space whales, you can see that we have a, uh, we have five of them, Captain, and so on and so forth, you can see he's got a nice little um, description there. Um, so we also have the black hole there, some mines and so on, and wherever your mouse is pointing it will give you the uh, the bearing and the range to that location, which helps in giving the captain and the helmsman um, information about the location of objects. Basically, when your captain wants you to go somewhere, he will ask the science officer where it is. The science officer will um, either mouse over it or you can click on it, and then he can find out the direction and range from that, um, that way. And then he can tell that to the helmsman so that the helmsman can point us at that bearing and then make their way that distance to the object. Uh, so you can see we've got various enemy ships over here at the moment. We also have some allied ships around, the Xenos, the minefields, black holes, uh, space monsters, so on and so forth. But you can see we have these grey things that I told you about before, and these are unidentified ships. So what we can do as the science officer is if we click on one of them, you can see a green marker comes up, and if we press the scan button in the corner, you can see that we have a circle that goes round and slowly fills up. And once it is filled up, we will have some information. 
So there it goes, and now you can see the outline of the ship. It gives you more detailed information on the bearing and direction. It gives you the call sign. And over here you can see it, what its shield levels are, what sort of ship it is. So this is a Kralian cruiser. And it gives you um, some basic information about the ship, like what armaments it has, how big it is, and a little bit of backstory on exactly the, on the nature of the ship. Now what we can then do is scan it for a second time. So we'll press the button again, and you see once again we have a green circle that fills up as it goes around. And once that has filled up, we will get some more information. So there it goes, and you can see we now have some intel here. The captain does not practice the Kralian religion faithfully. Also, the ship is overpowered. So this gives us more detailed information on the ship and what to expect from it. And then we also have the shield harmonics. Now this is what I mentioned earlier when I was talking about weapons and the and the um, the beam frequencies of A, B, C, D, or E. So you can see we have A, B, C, D, and E here. And you can see the bars are different heights. Now this references the shield strength of the, the various components of the enemy shield. So you can see the highest is A, um, and the lowest is E, and the lowest is the important one, because th when the bar is low, it means there is a, weak the, a weakness in the enemy ship's shields. So if the captain asks you to scan this particular ship and find out what the shield uh, weakness was, you would tell the weapons officer that it was E. So the weapons officer, let's hop into the weapons console, would switch his frequency to E, and that means that the shields would drop a lot quicker when we were in combat with the ship. So, for example, if we shot it in with frequency A, it would take four times as much as it would take to um, get the shields down in E, probably. Or something along those lines. Um, and so that's actually pretty much it for the science officer. There's, it's a fairly simple thing to control, but there's still um, it's all about making sure that your captain is well informed on the current state of enemy ships, and indeed allied ships as well, and tell you... Tell the captain what is going on in the sector, find out all this information in great detail about the enemy ships. And you can make use of this, um, the captain has not practiced the Kralian religion faithfully information, um, as I will show you shortly. So that is the science um, console, and now we will go into the engineering console. So you saw a little bit of this before, because this screen here is basically the, the info screen that tells you the status of the ship. Um, it's got various nodes, and if we mouse over these nodes, you can see this one, uh, If it says up here when I mouse over them, so that is primary beam, so it's that, that is front shield, um, that's also front shield, front shield, front shield, torpedo, primary beam, um, and also we have a Damcon team here, this is Damcon team 3, they're currently in a sensor node, and they have 6 members out of their normal 6. Um, when the node that they are in gets damaged, um, the Damcon teams may take casualties, meaning that their number drops down, and it means that their ability to repair things um, lowers significantly. Now you can control these guys using this button. So this is the autonomous button. When this is activated, um, the Damcon teams will move around um, of their own accord and repair things as they see fit. Now if we press this, it switches off, and we now have control of our... Um, team so we can select one and then we can send it over to a different part of the ship and you can see they start making their way through the corridors and it looks pretty damn cool if I do say so myself uh, moving along through the uh, the the um, corridors there or the Jeffrey's tubes or whatever they use to move around so you can do that with all of them you can I'll send this guy to this impulse engines node the positioning of the nodes is sort of related to where they would be on the ship so of course all the engine stuff is at the back we've got warp in the uh, in the sort of warp core area that you would expect there to be and then we have impulse sort of on the on the nacelles on either side and then of course we have beams on the front torpedoes a little bit further back maneuvering in the middle and so on and so forth um, so now what we also have down here is some um, oops, excuse me we have some uh, bars here and what these have is power levels so we have this one this is at a hundred percent they're all at hundred percent at the moment and then you can see we have some numbers beneath them so that one's 1 1.8 uh, we got 0 0.6 1.2 2.4 and so on and so forth and these are the current power usage of the system when it is not in in use so at the moment this is how much power is being used if you add all these up that's how much the power is draining by but the ship also has a charge rate so that balances it out and at the moment we're not actually using much power because we're not moving. When you are moving, um, the power usage will go up and um, the power will drain. Of course, you will need to go to um, a station to replenish that and um, get it back up to a thousand, or you can use one of the anomalies that you can find around the place to um, recharge it that way. 
Um, so what we can do here is and move these sliders around to increase the amount of power that we send to this. So we've now got it at 300% and the power usage is 16.2. And as you can also see, this bar here was shooting up and it's now in, in yellow. It goes up to orange and into red. And what this is, is the overheating. You can see it starts flashing there because we're getting to, into dangerous overheating. Uh, if we drop the power usage down to zero, we're now getting zero on there and the bar will start to deplete. So this is the overheating marker. Um, what happens is if you overtax a system, so if it's, go if it's going anywhere above 100, it will start to overheat. The more above 100 you are, the more it will overheat. Um, and the same goes for being under 100. So if you go below that, then it will um, cool down a bit. If you leave it at exactly 100, then it will stay in whatever current state it is. Um, a way to deal with the overheating is with these circles here. So if we um, click on one of these, I clicked on the third one up, so you can now see these bottom three are full and um, the, well, the they have white markers in them and that means that they have coolant in them so um, this means that you will cool down the uh, the system so if we get it up to 183% or whatever there um, and then put 4 units of coolant in you can see that it's reducing even though we are above 100% um, so this is how you, you manage the system you put extra power into the systems and then you put coolant in to uh, prevent them from overheating and what this means is that you can um, increase the power of various systems, or oh, you can also use these arrows by the way to increase and reduce it. You have 8 units of coolant in total and you can complete missions in the game to uh, get more of the more units of coolant to keep more things cool. And um, for each of these different systems it will have a different effect um, um, increasing the power to them. So for example with primary beams if you increase it to 300% then they will fire three times as fast and or do three times as much damage or something along those lines it will become more powerful. Uh, with torpedoes, the time to load and unload will in reduce, so that you can um, uh, you can do more m missile firing in a shorter amount of time. Something to note, though, is that um, at the moment we have 0 0.6. If we increase it, it goes to 5.4. That's nine times the the power 100%. Even though you're only timesing the actual um, the power usage by uh, three times. Um, and the reason for this is that it's it, there's sort of an exponential thing going on. So it costs a lot more to get to 300% than 200% because you're overcharging the systems and it's inefficient and so on and so forth. Um, what I'm also noticing is that we're getting some overheating in this sensor system and I don't think I've messed with this bar. And I believe you can have overheating sort of bleeding from some nodes to other nodes and things like that. That's a possibility. So that if um, like primary beam overheats then front shield might overheat a bit as well just because it's nearby. But that could be a complete load of rubbish, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so moving on, if you increase sensors, it increases the rate at which the science officer can scan enemy ships. So it will get the circle will fill up much faster and you can get a lot more information about um, enemy ships in a much shorter time. Um, for maneuvering, it increases the speed at which the ship can turn, which is quite simple. So we'll just, that, that's a quick one to go through. Impulse, that increases the speed of impulse. Um, warp increases the speed of warp, so the fastest you can possibly go is if you are at warp 4 with warp fully charged. Um, front shield, it will increase the charge rate and the strength, I believe, of the shield, and maybe just the charge rate. And the same for the rear shield, but of course for the rear shield. Um, now, um, there's also a thing, I believe, about efficiency. So if you allocate more power to a system, then it will use less power to run that system, but of course it will use more power generally anyway. So if we increase front shield, it goes up to 10 there rather than 3, um, and that will be an increased usage. But it may decrease the power usage of actually recharging the shields. That's something I'm still not entirely sure of, but I'm fairly sure that there's something along those lines active. So um, when you're going at high warp, you want to increase the, the um, power allocated to warp a little bit to be more efficient so you use less power. And I believe that it, it's very inefficient to go at warp 1 with with barely any power in warp because you use a huge amount of power to go at warp 1 when you have barely any power going into warp 1, if you know what I mean. Uh, of course, if we take damage to various nodes, it will um, these things here will drop down from 100% to lower percentages and so on, as I mentioned earlier. And then the final feature that we have for um, uh, engineering is presets. So we have some presets here so if I let's put four units of coolant into primary beam and then increase it to like 150 put a unit of coolant in sensors put that up a little bit um, and then we'll like turn off maneuvering 
what I can now do is press store and what, let's click 4. So what we've now done is stored this preset in 4. So if you now return everything to 100, like so, and then we press 4, it will return to what it previously was. So basically this is a way to save presets. So you can set up um, settings for certain situations like limping home with no power left or attacking large ships or dealing with fighters or chasing things down so that when a certain type of when power is needed in certain things you can just um, activate the the mode that you've set rather than having to manually move all the things around and so on and you can save certain setups that you like and that is pretty much it for engineering so now we will go over to the fifth station and that is comms so you can see what we have here is a bunch of messages so basically everyone is sending you messages so um, the science vessels asking us to do missions for them bases doing the same enemies taunting us and trying and saying that they're going to kill us and uh, stations reporting that they've produced more weaponry and things like that um, and you can't do anything particularly here but if we click on these you can use these to um, contact ships so let's try enemy so we click that and you can see we have a list of enemies here we have seven enemies on this list um, you can you can see the call sign and what type of ship they are um, and they they are sorted by how near they are so this is the nearest ship currently while this is the furthest away um, so if we try hailing this Kralian dreadnought here you can see there's various options so we can ask them to surrender if we think that they're um, they've got low morale and they're not they don't want to fight that much anymore and we've also got three different insult options so you can call them a worm face or you can insult the ship, or you can call them ugly, or so on. Um, and these are for taunting them, so if you get the right one, then they will get angry at you, and they will start flying towards you, and they'll have a lot of... D they'll, they'll ignore normal tactical um, options and just fly straight at you, and you can use that to make them charge into bad situations and get themselves injured, or, or whatever, or just um, draw them into a trap and kill them. Um, but there's a only one of them will usually work properly. I believe the system is that one will um, have no effect on them, and then they'll stop communicating with you. One of them will insult them enough that they will charge at you, and then one of them will not have any effect. And the way to find out which one works is to use the science console. So if we hop back to science, we will uh, let's try moving over here. And we have a a Kralian ship here. Um, it's uh, the reason that we can already tell what it is is because it's been within range of an allied ship or an allied station, so that gives us the basic information, but if we want more we have to scan it. So here it says that the captain is unmarried and duplicitous and the ship is underpowered. So this is M06, if we go to comms, and we'll go back, and we'll find M06, there it is. And let's see what options that we have. We will insult his warship because it's underpowered. And you can see that we've now annoyed him and he's coming straight at us because that was the correct one to do. If you insulted him in a different way, it might not work. For example, if they're unmarried and you insult their wife, it won't work and things like that. So that's a, a fun little thing you can do. Um, so comms and signs want to communicate over what um, insults to use so that the ships come flying at you. You can also contact stations. So you can see we've got the four stations here. If you select one of them, you can ask to s tell them to stand by for docking. You can ask them to report the status, You can ask, or you can ask them to build certain weapons. And if you tell them to build this, like tell them to build a nuke, then they will now continuously build nukes for the, the rest of the game, unless you tell them otherwise. Um, you can also contact other ships, and these are the allied ships that you have. So we have a science vessel here, you can tell them what direction to point in, or you can tell them um, to attack the nearest enemy, proceed to a certain location, or go and defend somebody. Uh, that's pretty much it for those. And then the one remaining thing that comms can do is press this red alert button and when you press this an alarm goes off for the other stations and you can see everything goes red for them. Um, this n has no particular purpose, it's just for a bit of fun you and then you can switch it off again. And there's a couple more modes but they're all sort of side ones. So we have Observer, this shows a sort of cinematic view of the ship or things near the ship. Um, so you can use this to just watch the game as it unfolds. Um, there's Captain's Map which is basically like the science console but you can't actually use any particular, uh, you can't scan anything, you can only look at it and zoom in on certain things and find out information about them. And then here we have the, um, I forget what this is called, it, uh, it's uh, Game Master View. So this is 
um, sort of like the science view, but you have complete a complete view of the whole map, and you can see things hidden inside nebulas and things like that that you couldn't see normally. And you can send messages to certain things where you can see who they're from and what the message says, and it will go to a certain station or a certain ship. Um, and at the moment, that's all you can do. Later on, you'll probably be able to spawn in ships and things like that, but at the moment, the, it's fairly limited what it can do. Um, and that is pretty much all of the stations, so hopefully that was a, a good tutorial for you, and you'll be able to um, do a much better job of uh, playing Artemis and working well as a, as a crew with your friends and so on and so forth. Um, so that's it for today, and now I shall say goodbye. Thank you for watching, and I shall see you next time.